Schools were a medieval obsession. Endless academic energy was spent in seeking to perfect an explanation of how the universe works. Fusing the Old and the New Testaments with Greek philosophy, science and mathematics, scholars formulated universal laws. And music was a key player. Nearly 2,000 years earlier, the philosopher Pythagoras had discovered correspondences between the musical notes that he heard as beautiful and harmonious and the mathematical intervals he could measure between them. The scientific laws behind this, he declared, must be the same as those that governed the motions of the stars and planets. Medieval scholars seized on this idea of harmonic purity and tried to produce a set of rules that would work for music and that fitted into the greater philosophical scheme of things. Every theorist talks technically. They talk endlessly about details of notation, which is codified in this sort of fantastic scholastic way. So everything has got a structure, everything has got a place in which it fits. We actually have curricula for music from the 1260s, and it's exactly what you'd expect. It's much more akin to physics than what we might understand as music, music today. But it's not just theory. One of the beauties of music is that you can easily put theory into practice. This is a, a workshop in Essex that belongs to Nick, who in fact is um, a guitar maker. You see the guitars on the wall. And he's going to show me how to make a very simple instrument, <laughs> the monochord. Now, I'm completely incompetent at this, but he's going to lead me through. Right, Nick, uh, let's start. OK, Simon, <laughs> this is a very simple uh, instrument compared to a guitar making. Yeah. We start off with four identical-sized pieces of wood. We have four corner pieces, which I'm going to get you to glue on. Oh. There's right. your block of wood. OK, so you just need a very thin bead of glue, just a squiddle, we call it in the trade. And then this is the mucky bit. Right. That's fine. The monochord is really That's simple it. to build, but what it does oh. is quite clever. A determination to demonstrate that Pythagoras' rules could be applied to Western church music inspired the theorists to try to measure precisely the fractions of notes within an octave. Great. That's it. OK, um, so that's stuck. We leave right. that to dry. I think um, if we're very careful, we can probably put the bass on. They discovered that two intervals, the fourth and the fifth, okay. produced a satisfactory resonance, that's a so harmony, clear. just as Pythagoras's pure maths had predicted. With this instrument, the monochord, okay. these mathematical relationships could be both measured and demonstrated. Now, we're going to have at one end a tailpiece, and at the other end, we're going to have a guitar machine head. Um, right. <laughs> That's it, you're in. The monochord is simply a box with a single string. When you pluck this string, it will vibrate at a specific frequency, and that produces a note. G, is that right? It's close. If you halve its length, then your pluck string will vibrate at twice the frequency of the original, and the note will be an octave higher. Can I do it? Because this is going to be a disaster. Don't, please or... don't. Right, the one the other side. Perfect octave. Using this little sliding bridge, you can subdivide it endlessly, and like magic, you can calculate and both see and hear the different harmonic intervals and their relationships. You get the sense that this is. Pythagoras, this is the perfect intervals, Absolutely. this is all Greek yeah. philosophy, but this is actually a completely practical instrument, isn't yeah. it? And there's so, nothing quite like hearing it in the flesh, so to speak, so you, yeah. you actually hear a theory being put into practice. And here I am, proudly going off with my own monochord. Good. Well, I've, learned, you need a, a I've gym, learned a lot about it as well. I think, so too. <laughs> I think so too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, this is where maths meets music. Mark, this is the string divided two to one. Right. That's right. It should be an octave, shouldn't it? Should be. We hope. Would you sing that, please, Mark? Oh. Oh. That's oh. a perfect octave. We think that's about a C, don't we? That's around about a C. Around right about a there. C. Right. The second interval is a fifth. So we have this is the lower note. 
Oh, D. And then this should be. As you sing it first. Oh, magic. That's a fifth. So that's an A. And this should be a fourth. So. Oh, oh. Perfect. That's the principles. Pythagorean principles. This is science and music working together at the birth of harmony. Leonan and the Notre Dame singers discovered that the notes which sounded right when sung together corresponded to the ideas about harmonic purity developed by the theoreticians and demonstrated by the monochord. Um, Harry, I spent a long and um, entertaining morning building this, which is my monochord. I'm very proud of it. So what precisely was it used for? It's very impressive. I mean, and <laughs> very you. impressive indeed. <laughs> it was used quite simply to, to, to give the note, uh -huh. um, but more importantly to teach young musicians what intervals were, and particularly the fourth and the fifth. We're going to try and reconstruct the very early stages of organum, is that right? Yes, I mean, organum is based on the chant. Yeah. So we've got that wonderful chant, Ecdies, for Easter Day. Right. I mean, let's sing the chant first of all, very simply. Uh -huh. Now, on very high feast days, special occasions, this could well have been sung at the octave, like this. So that's the other line singing an octave below, and it gives it, obviously, a bit more weight and... Yeah, and you get a feeling of a, of a real a festive occasion, don't you? Right, so that, that's the, the, the first thing we think they probably ever did, was to add an octave, just yes. to give it a bit of ballast. Absolutely. Really. And then what was the next stage? This well, is a tricky one, this isn't is, this, it? This is interesting, because this is the interval of the fifth. This should be a fifth. The Chinese. So we sing the chant like this. <laughs> Now that to me sounds like a sort of rather hollow, it's incredible it's sinister sound actually. Down it's down a it. very hollow sound, yes, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is absolutely hollow and sort of suits the arches of this church. But then we have something slightly different and we hear the interval of a fourth, a little lower. You hear that chant now. So here is the range of notes that will harmonise when Leonan remodels the plain song as polyphony with the long drone notes and elaborate second voice. Those three intervals are the three basic intervals that we get from Pythagorean theory and theorists at this time were writing about those intervals and saying these are the These are the pure, the perfect intervals. If you can imagine that Hecdia is heard you know, on Easter Day it's the first time. It must have been the same effect as, uh, you know, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring to yeah. Parisian yeah. audience. Yeah. I mean, the, some people must have hated it. Others thought, wow, what is this and fantastic music. These tunes, especially those for the great feast days, would have been known to everyone in the church, the congregation in the nave just as much as the choir in the stalls. But who was this music being sung for? It was, of course, being directed up to heaven. The ultimate, the final audience for this music was God. The music soars up to God and his saints and his angels. 
and it also self-consciously aspires to perfection, the perfection of heaven. Pure but complex, the voices independent but accurately positioned against one another. An intellectual exercise governed by mathematical patterns but with a mystical spiritual intention. The design and complexity of the music reflecting the increasingly flamboyant style of the architecture. The flying buttresses, the pointed windows, the tracery, the statuary, the vastly ambitious stained glass, this is the real Gothic. So this is the Sainte Chapelle, and it's absolutely extraordinary. Who built it and why? It was built by uh, Louis IX. This was going to house the relics of the Passion and especially the Crown of Thorns. And that was going to make it the centerpiece of Western Christianity. So again, it was a big religious statement and it was a big political statement. Like Notre Dame. Like Notre Dame. But what was most incredible about this chapel is really the architecture. You've got this new technology, and some people describe it as what's called the triumph of the intangible. If you look around you here, this is like a window on heaven. It's psychedelic yeah. in the sense that it's, it's trippy, it's visionary, and it's incredible transcendental beauty as well, in some, some ways, the apogee of Western Christian art. <laughs> There's something beautiful about this as well, which is to do with the 13th century, and it's to do with the material melted into the intangible, into the impossible. What happens here is impossible. And you've got to remember, to the medieval mind, this is a mind-blowing experience. Everything here is a movement towards the space of the beyond and the divine. I mean, for them, it would have been a picture of heaven. It looks like heaven. It looks like the very heavens themselves. And I find it mind-blowing looking at it now, so you can only imagine what that would have meant to the medieval imagination. Every single feature of these extraordinary buildings was designed to convey this dizzying theological message. Their elegant geometry reflecting the concept of God's ordered and harmonious universe. The new polyphony was an integral part of this, as vibrant and richly textured as the stained glass and stonework. So, along with Gothic architecture, this music spread throughout northern France and then very quickly throughout medieval Christendom. Paris had become the preeminent city in Western Europe in the 12th century. The city itself was expanding as a centre for learning in terms of the schools which would become the University of Paris. And it was also a great centre for trade because of the River Seine. There are people coming into Paris from all across Europe, so they're going to Notre Dame and hearing this music, and they're seeing this fabulous new building, and therefore anybody with an interest in music recognises this as something quite uh, mind-blowing, and is rapidly picking up manuscripts of it, and taking what they find there back to their home country. So presumably some people said, Oh, you must hear the new layer now, it's fantastic. Absolutely. It was possible for you to send a book to another place and for some other singer to read it from the page and, and make the musical sounds without having to have another singer come with him to teach him the tune. This is the flowering of the Middle Ages. From the end of the 12th century when Lernan flourished until the Renaissance two centuries later. The startling new harmonies of the Notre Dame school would now be heard everywhere, not just in the new Gothic cathedrals, but in monasteries, aristocratic chapels, and every church that could obtain a set of music manuscripts and some singers who could read them.
Although there is no one document we could call the Magnus Liber, there are about half a dozen surviving Notre Dame manuscripts scattered across Europe, evidence of how efficiently polyphony was now being exported. In the Herzog August Library in Wolfenbüttel in northern Germany, I discovered two of the best preserved examples. These are our Notre Dame manuscripts. The binding is modern, but the content is the original parchment and script, probably of the middle of the 13th century. In this time, parchment was the only material to write books. Paper was not yet known in Western Europe, and so parchment made from sheep, geese, or mainly calves. It's very simple, isn't it? Uh, it's a working yes. handbook. There's yes. nothing ornamental about it. And presumably it was much, much used. There's a lot of words there. It so must have been handled yeah. by generations of singers. It arrived in Germany after centuries of use in Scotland. It's slightly grubby, stained and peppered with splashes of ancient wax. Oh, this is extraordinary, isn't it? <laughs> It's an enormous amount of uh, music. It's not difficult to imagine a medieval singer in a darkened Gothic church trying to follow the notes by the light of a flickering candle. Wieder rund um Nails. Nails. Yes, that's it. Wow. It's fantastic. The second of the two collections looked and felt rather different. This is a different writer, isn't it? Yes, it's a different writer. This is uh, surely written in France. We don't know who ordered this manuscript. Probably it was written for someone who was interested in a little bit more beauty and luxury. And therefore, these initials were painted with colors and even with gold, uh, which was a quite expensive thing uh, in the Middle Ages. The copious work here is so delicate and so intricate, and you can see the music sort of echoing the architecture for which it was composed. You can turn over some more words, yes. love looking at it. With scores like these being copied and circulated, French polyphony began its inevitable takeover of Europe, changing fundamentally the way choir masters, singers, and congregations thought about the relationship between music and divine worship. All the key factors that powered the Gothic Revolution were now in place. A new method of writing down notes, the monochord, new acoustic spaces created by the Gothic style of architecture. Everything comes together to provide the circumstances in which polyphonic music can flourish. Leonas is not the only name that has survived from the Notre Dame School of Composers. We also know that his successor was called Perrotin. Within a generation, Perrotin had compiled a new edition of Leonas' work. Anonymous Ford describes Perrotin as a master who wrote the best four-part polyphony. Sidera and Principes was written for the Feast of St. Stephen, the first Christian martyr and co-patron of Notre Dame. Just as the Gothic builders used flying buttresses and rib vaults to support all this tracery and stained glass, Perrotin used Leonin's development of Duple Morganum, the extended tenor drone and the Pythagoras-approved note intervals, to support more and more elaborate, interwoven vocal parts. So, Harry, we've arrived now at um, one of the big bang moments of Western music. So how long before this happened had the church been singing what we were singing? 
only a matter of about 50 years. I mean, we're really talking about the turn of the 12th right. century. Um, we have Leonin writing those duplum or garnum, and then Perotin coming along and revising it and actually turning it into four part. And now that obviously, by necessity, needs to change, much needs more organization. So this is Vido Domine's Perotin. It's, again, based on a plain song chant. Let's sing it. Let's sing the opening phrase. And you're going to ask me to sing it as well, aren't you? Certainly am. Well, it's on your head, be it. <laughs> uh, I've got my um, modern version of a, of a monochord. A monochord. Wieder und Ornes. Great, so that's the basic tune. Now, what's he do? Now, the same as learning, in that we have the long note values. So the plain song is elongated. Poor old Jonathan has yeah, to do it by himself. Massive lungs. Well, you can join me on this. Yes. 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 yes, well, I thought you might say that. <laughs> and, okay. And then over the top of it, we have these added parts. Duplum, second part. Triplum, third part. Quadruplum, the fourth part. Um, and if, if I were to sing it with you... <laughs> we'd get extra and destroy, and destroy the beauty of the whole thing. <laughs> do we do what I was, was always taught was called staggered breathing? Which yes. is that I breathe yeah. and you don't, yeah. and then you breathe and I don't. Yeah. It's organic. Through osmosis, works. we yes. know when the other person is going or to... Or you can indicate through the subtle use of your little fig your finger oh, really? on, on the page. If you're going to breathe, then I know that you're oh, breathing really? and I won't. Shall we have a go? <laughs> Here we go. The Different interpretations. Our of our fingers work. Sorry, that was, so just, so that was actually the most exciting thing for me. Is our fingers work. I mean, I think the thing is that chord at the beginning, the impact that would have had in 1198 when it was first ever yes. performed, Christmas Day, this is a, a, an amazing moment. Yes. It still sounds very rich. Yeah. It does. Music. Yes. It's, a, it's an athletic thing. That's the other thing. I mean, we've only given a bit now, but when you hear the whole thing, mm. it's it's a big thing. It's amazing as we go through the piece, though. We've got great moments of, of real discord. I'm going to just um, sing a little passage. Do you have the drone? Oh. It's the most fantastic cadence, that, it's isn't it? It is absolutely brilliant. It gives it a very earthy feel as well, mm, doesn't yes. it? Just despite the fact that it's spiritual music and, and sacred music, it gives it a real earthy quality that mm. I think would really ring And true. many a modern composer would be proud of that moment. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. V It's not hard to imagine how they might have felt when they first sung this four-part music, which is, had never been done before, really. Um, and it's got an amazing rawness and an amazing power. You can just imagine that they would have felt overwhelmed by that. This was really a new departure, a real moment in history. must have sounded like to a congregation turning up in the 12th century and hearing that amazing texture, that chordal four-part ringing down the nave and then coming back, absolutely amazing. They are now experiencing something completely new. Contemporary listeners reacted with the medieval equivalent of shock and awe. The Bishop of Chartres, who attended services in Notre Dame at this time, gave this first-hand description. 
That which is most tuneful among the birds cannot equal them. Hearing the soft harmonies of the various singers, some taking the high parts and others the low, some singing in advance, others following in the rear, you would think yourself listening to a concert of sirens rather than men and wonder at the power of voices. Such is their skill in running up and down the scale, so wonderful the shortening or multiplying of notes, the repetition or emphatic utterance of the phrases. The treble and shrill notes are so mingled with the tenor and the bass that the ears lose all power of judgment. When this is taken to excess, it is more fitting to excite lust than devotion. But if it is kept within the bounds of moderation, it drives care away from the soul, confers joy, peace, and exaltation in God, and transports the soul to the society of angels. The Notre Dame School gave the Western world its first taste of developed harmony, and that taste would lead on to Bach, as we shall hear later in this series, and also to the harmonic riches of Mozart, Beethoven, Wagner, and the whole range of popular music. Vetus Arbit Litera is a celebration. This is the day of joy. Let us rejoice, says the text. Our guilt is forgiven. And surely you can hear that joy in the complex hypnotic play of the four voices. In the next episode of Sacred Music, my journey will take me to Rome to discover the unaccompanied choral music of the Italian Renaissance and its greatest master, Palestrina. His story will take us into the heart of the labyrinth of 16th century Vatican politics, where popes wield power and authority and singers take the praise of God to dizzy new heights. Evocate, see.